Hi hey folks, welcome to the Dash of Alana. I got a review for you today. Actually, it's a little bit more than a review. It's going to be a two-part in-depth look at the rules, Field of Glory. And that's this right here, the third edition of the rules. We're going to be looking at this set of rules, the quality, the production quality, the rules themselves somewhat. I don't want to get too heavy into the rules, but I do want to give you guys a good idea of what makes this set of rules tick, whether or not it's worth buying or investing your time in, what's unique about it. Now, is it going to be something you would enjoy on your tabletop? Plus, I'm going to give my opinion on it and whether or not I enjoy the game and where it sits on my bookshelf. So this is part one, folks. So here we are, folks. This is Field of Glory, third edition, published by Cavalier Books over in the UK. Uh, the copyright holder is still Slytherin. Uh, however, if you take a look at this book, it looks almost precisely like the old Osprey version. Same hardback, similar binding. It's all pretty much the same same production quality you'd expect from Field of Glory. It's 168 pages of wargaming goodness. It includes an index, 10 pages of play sheets, which you can copy. Unfortunately, this, this set of rules does not come with its own separate play sheets. You will have to photocopy them or scan them from the rule book or get them online. Uh, there's also 42 pages of appendices and 27 pages of introduction and basic information on Field of Glory and Ancients Gaming, how to get started, uh, basic terms and concepts used in the game. This book covers it all, to be honest with you folks. Very well done in that regards. Okay, folks, before we go any further, it's good to point out right from the get-go that Field of Glory is designed for typical standard-sized armies, say two or three hundred figures in an army uh, on a six-by-four table. If you're playing with 15-millimeter uh, figures, that would be the normal way to play Field of Glory. Uh, nothing unusual about that. However, there is a version of Field of Glory 3 called Fog 300. It's made by a fan of the the rules and it's a really good system that allows you to play with smaller armies and a smaller tabletop typically the tabletop is anywhere from two foot square like dba or two by three which is what i've been using currently your armies are 300 points in size which equates to about maybe twice the size of a dba army maybe bigger than that uh, maybe a standard size 200 ap l'art du la guerre sized army. So it's around that range. It really allows you to play and get a feel for Field of Glory 3rd Edition without having to, to amass a huge collection of salt figures uh, for the tabletop before you can play. So right off the get-go, keep that in mind that you can jump into this with Fog 300. It's easy to download. Uh, there's a little simple set of rules, not much changes to the rules themselves. It's more to do with the army lists and how you choose your armies that makes Fog 300 stand out. But uh, you can get that on the internet. It's just a few pages long and boom, you can be up and playing Field of Glory. And that'll help you working towards playing a full game of Field of Glory. So let's take a look and see what's in here. You get this cover page here, which is a beautiful map. It's replicated in the back as well, the same map. Beautiful looking. The pages are glossy, quite sturdy. And here's your table of contents right there, folks. Now again, it has an introduction. The basics covers troops. The fourth chapter is battle groups, a term you'll need to know about in this game. Uh, next is command and control. Six is example armies. Uh, and that's basically your introduction chapter altogether in separate, six separate sections. Uh, it is color-coded, if you notice here. And this code here is all the introductory stuff, like the basics and the troops. It helps describe what, uh, how these rules work in terms of battle groups and troops and the basic terminology used in the game. Now, the next sections here, uh, playing the game, followed by general movement rules. These are two very important sections that help define, in the case here, general movement, uh, that help define specific parts of the game. Uh, playing the game, of course, covers the basics, how you lay out your terrain and all those basic things you do. It's not the actual rules and how to do the things, but it, it, they describe how uh, Field of Glory works in this respect. After this, you get to chapter... Uh, nine, which is now, this is the this is the core of the rule book. This is the rules, and it starts by following the sequence of play. And the first 
part of that sequence is the impact phase. Here it talks all about that impact phase. This is followed by the maneuver phase, which is the second thing you do in the turn sequence. The third thing is the shooting phase. Again, it's its own separate chapter. And the melee phase follows that. That's where the close combat is resolved, and this section covers all that. Uh, next, we get into something very interesting. This is the combat mechanism, or the combat mechanic that these rules use. It is quite unique, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But this isn't part of the turn sequence. The turn sequence is basically your impact phase, maneuver phase, shooting phase, melee phase, and finally, the joint action phase. So there's five phases to the game, uh, and that makes up a full turn. And you will notice that the combat mechanic is described in its own separate chapter, apart from shooting and apart from melee. Uh, the same combat mechanism is used in both procedures, shooting and melee, as well as impact, because basically your impact phase, which every turn starts with, is your charges. It's where guys move into contact with the enemy, and fighting is resolved. So there's three phases here where combat is decided, and that's where the combat mechanism chapter comes into play. Uh, I will note that if you're just learning these rules, you're probably going to be doing a lot of page flipping, and it's simply because of this the way the rules are organized in this manner. Like for instance, in order to figure out how to resolve the details of a melee combat, you gotta skip ahead to the combat mechanism chapter. Uh, and from there, you might have to flip back to the impact phase if you're trying to resolve an impact phase combat. So there's a lot of flipping between the combat mechanism and the various phases where combat can be resolved. So keep that in mind when you're first learning the game. The joint action phase is just that. It's where both sides are doing things like moving their commanders together and uh, removing units that have broken from the tabletop, etc. Uh, now the next chapter is battle group deterioration. These are the details of how battle groups, that's the term used for units in the game, how they deteriorate, how they fall apart, how they go from steady troops in the battlefield to running away for their lives. Uh, basically your morale and that sort of thing is covered in this chapter. And finally, victory and defeat talks about how you win a battle, how you win a game, victory points and, and such. Next, we have special features that might come into play during a battle, like works and things like that. Uh, special things, elephants, chariots are all discussed in there, how they affect the game. Now you'll notice on the other side here, we have the reference section. This is really useful. Uh, there are nine appendices, as you can see here, and each one focuses on a specific aspect of gameplay. Uh, scales, base sizes, and detailed troop types. The details on troop types are all covered in Appendix 1. Uh, battlefield terrain, visibility, and disorder effects. Uh, like when troops move through muddy ground, how does it affect them? That's where disorder kicks into gear. Uh, that's Appendices 2. Appendices 3 is glossary of terms, followed by setup rules. This is how you lay out your terrain and deploy your troops on the battlefield. That's what that appendice is all about. Next, army composition and the points system that Field of Glory uses. If you're interested in points, there you go. This explains how it works and how values are come about. Uh, next, we have choosing your army. Uh, some basics on how to use the army lists and the army books that come for this game. And incidentally, there's planned three books of army lists for Field of Glory 3rd Edition. So you can expect three separate books. I will be doing uh, reviews on those separate books that I come across as well. So stay, stay tuned for that. Uh, this covers how you choose your army using the point system. Next, we have examples of unusual situations. And I will say that this book does cover uh, the rules details quite well. It's very concise, uh, and it does give plenty of examples of gameplay, uh, particularly unusual ones. And this whole appendices here is all about that. Next, we have... Uh, the Ready Reckoner, which is a term used to like sometimes in the rules that say you suffer a minus one if the unit suffered two, uh, one out of three bases are hit. Suffers one hit per so many bases, that kind of thing. This is an easy way to just look it up and see how many hits you uh, need to accumulate to get that penalty. That's really all that section is. Uh, 
The final one is full turn sequence. And this I highly recommend. It's two pages that you print out uh, or get a hold of online. And finally, we got an index, further information about the game, and quick reference sheets. Uh, about 10 pages of reference sheets uh, that you can copy, uh, like combat results tables and variable movement distance tables. So here we go into the introduction. As you can see, we've got this beautiful artwork, which is throughout the rule book, Peter Dennis. Uh, this is the introduction to the rules, and, and basically miniature wargaming, really. Uh, like heading here is what is miniature wargaming? Introduction of Field of Glory and a design philosophy, which is really nice. Then it gets into the basics of Field of Glory. Now, note this is color-coded. If we go back and take a look at the contents page, once again, the chapters are color-coded to kind of help you find uh, the chapters of the rules you're looking for. In this case, we've got the basics. The tip boxes are also matching in color to the chapter, which is nice. Uh, so this is the basics. This is all about measuring your base sizes and defining the troops in the battlefield. Uh, one note, base sizing is DBX standard. So if you're familiar with DBX basting, like in DBMM or DBM or, or DBA, uh, you're good to go. This, this set of rules is designed for troops mounted for DBX. Defining the troops, uh, basically, they're either battle troops or skirmishers. Skirmishers are basically all your light troops, light cav and light foot. Everything else is battle troops. Uh, the troop type, such as foot or mounted. Uh, then we've got their armor, what they're equipped with. They're heavy, armored, protected, or unprotected. Their quality, which is either elite, superior, average, and finally poor. Uh, their training, they're either drilled or they're undrilled, basically. That's what training represents. Roman legionnaires would be drilled. Uh, your Gaul warriors would be undrilled. Capabilities is special weapons they might have or uh, the tactics they would use as a unit, for instance, longbow armed troops or sling armed troops or swordsmen. Again, legionnaires will be considered swordsmen or skilled swordsmen, both of which are capabilities that troops might have. And again, here it talks about skirmishers and the category of battle troops, which are your non skirmishers and uh, skirmishers, as well as a definition of shock troops. Some troops are considered shock troops, and it will have an effect on the battle, usually troops that are forced to charge, for instance, without orders. That could happen, and it's typically from shock troops. Uh, foot with impact foot capability are considered shock troops. Remember, capabilities are over here, and impact foot is a capability. Finally, it talks about camps. It goes into battle groups, which are basically units in Field of Glory. A certain number of bases make up a battle group. Again, you'd have to look at the army list to see what constitutes a battle group or a unit for your particular army. So it talks all about battle groups, what they are, and how to form them up. Uh, the various formations they can be in. Uh, Battle group quality. Now, this is, like we mentioned, elite, superior, average, or poor. And this will have a big impact on your game because it allows you to re-roll certain dice, some of which are close combat re-rolls, and other ones are just quality re-rolls. Elite troops, for instance, are allowed to re-roll ones and twos. Superior are allowed to re-roll ones. Poor troops have to roll or re-roll any sixes that they roll. And when these kick in, we'll tell you in the rules, uh, wherever it says quality rerolls apply, this rule applies. Uh, close combat rerolls apply, then the rerolls apply. Now, this is slightly different in close combat. Uh, you have to be one or two grades better in quality than your opponent in close combat to get the reroll capabilities. For instance, uh, sometimes commanders can join a unit and temporarily, while they're with them fighting in the front rank, uh, upgrade the quality temporarily of that battle group he is fighting with. Uh, so that's a bonus that commanders uh, have when they join units and fight in the front rank with their men. It upgrades their quality as long as they're in combat. Some troop types are also considered to be a tr uh, quality grade better during the impact phase. Uh, based on their troop type and how many of them there is. It's detailed right down here. Uh, battle group cohesion levels. There is steady, 
there is disrupted, there is fragmented, and finally there is broken, the four ladders of degradation in Field of Glory. Uh, those are the four cohesion levels. And when you're broken, you're broken. You're going to run away on the tabletop and eventually be removed. Uh, you start off as steady, you become disrupted, uh, and then after that you become fragmented. And finally, if it gets worse after that, you are broken. And that's outlined here, describes them. Now it talks about disorder. Disorder is a different type of uh, effect than as compared to steady, disrupted, fragmented, broken. You have disorder, which is literally just that, and it's a result of being in or moving through certain terrain types based on the troop type moving through it. So that's what disorder is, and there's two types of disorder. There's disordered, and there is severely disordered. Uh, next, it goes into command and control. How do commanders work? Now, there's basically uh, three levels of commander. There's inspired commanders like Genghis Khan and Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. And there's field commanders, uh, which are typical, competent, know-what-they're-doing type of commander in the field. And there's troop commanders, which are basically the equivalent of junior officers and such. Uh, they're not the best of commanders. But based on the commander type, one of those three, they will have a, a command range distance. 12 is the best. 8 is for a field commander. And the worst is 4 units within that range can do a little bit of extra special things. And we'll get into that. As a matter of fact, we're going to get right into it here. It's called Battle Lines. Battle Lines is basically uh, two or more units, and there's a limit to how many, that can work together. They all are side edge to side edge contact, facing the same direction, uh, and that's considered a battle line. And there has to be a commander attached to one of those units in the battle line, and all the units have to be within his command range to function as a battle line. And I guess the equivalent of a battle line would be like your groups in L'Arc du La Guerre and, and DBM and DBA, where you've got all your bases lined up and moving together as one. Uh, that's what battle lines are in Field of Glory. They're basically a way to efficiently move forward in battle. Uh, and there's some little requirements that have to be met to do that. But it's all outlined here in this section of the rules. It's quite clear. And then it goes into example armies. Uh, there are no army lists in the rule book, except for what they give you right here, which is the Roman army and a Carthaginian army to fight against it. Uh, and then it goes into a French army, an English army, in this case, King Edward III and King Philip of France. So it gives you an example of the army lists. And I won't go into too much detail about this. Uh, and now we're getting into the new section, new chapter here. This is playing the game. You can see it's colored green, um, as is this entire chapter. It tells you how the basics of setting up the game and how it plays, how it flows, what, what comes first, what comes second in terms of turns and phases. And like I said before, there's five phases in a turn, and each player gets one turn. Uh, so the first is the impact phase, followed by the maneuver phase, the shooting phase, where both sides uh, shoot, the melee phase, where both sides fight in melees. And the joint action phase, which again allows both players to do certain things, just move their commanders and such. Um, so that's the end of that chapter, actually, right there. Then it goes into general movement rules. Now, you'll pay close attention to this section. It contains a lot of rules that you need to know. Uh, to understand how movement works. I mean, all the basic core rules for moving are in this chapter. For instance, the move distan distances and, and what terrain disorders, what troop types. It's outlined on this page here. Lightfoot move five in open terrain. Heavy foot, like legionnaires, would move three or four movement units, it's called. I should make that clear that MU stands for movement units in uh, Field of Glory. And a movement unit is defined for 15 millimeter scale figures as one inch. So you'll be using your tape measures in this battle uh, instead of, say, a uh, base width like in DBX to measure your movement distances. This, this system uses inches. And it can be for the heavy infantry, again, three or four movement units in open ground. Now, they could move the faster rate, which is four. There's a little asterisk there, and it points down to here. It tells you what it is. Uh, actually, it tells you on the next page. 
Ah, I'll read this to you. Heavy infantry may move up to four movement units in open terrain if no part of their move passes within five movement units of enemy battle troops or fortified camp or within three movement units of enemy skirmishers or an unfortified camp. So if they're close to the enemy, they can't move as quickly. Uh, but if they're further away, they can move a little bit faster. So that's how that works. And of course, at the top of this chart, you have open ground, uneven ground, rough and difficult ground. These are the four terrain types, and they're all explained in the back of the book, what specific terrain, like woods and swamps and bogs and gentle hills, what category each of those pieces of terrain uh, counts as. And whenever a unit or battle group moves through that piece of terrain, it is limited to whatever the maximum MU or movement units is listed here in this chart. So it's very easy, straightforward, one chart. It tells you your movement rates in the different types of terrain. It also tells you, if you look at the bottom, if certain terrain types leads to disorder or severe disorder. And this is color coded. The dark green blocks are severely disordered. So any troops moving through difficult terrain, in the case of these heavy foot, uh, they would move to movement units and they would also be considered, color code here, severely disordered. Uh, the lighter gray or lighter green color is disordered and the open or clear spaces are just no effect. And it outlines the what happens when you're disordered or disordered right here. It's a very nice little convenient table and it's duplicated in the play charts as well. Now it goes into talking about simple and complex moves. You know, there's certain things you cannot do easily with your battle groups. Some moves are a little bit too complex, and that might require a test, what is known as the CMT test or the complex maneuver test or move test. And if you have to take one of these to do what you want in terms of movement, it will tell you on this next table over here. You look up the different types of movement you could, you could choose to do. And you cross-reference it with your troop type at the top here. For example, all skirmishers follow this column, uh, or this row, I should say, or column. Oh, right. Drilled and other, other than pikemen follow this column. Undrilled cavalry and light chariots follow this column. And undrilled uh, with commander and all pikesmen follow this column. And other undrilled without a commander follow that last column. And this will tell you uh, whether or not a test is required. If it says simple, no test is required. It's a simple maneuver. If complex is the result, you have to make a CMT test. Impossible is the other uh, possibility here, which is basically self-explanatory. You can't do it. For example, let's look at a turn of 90 degrees while stationary. It's simple for just about every troop type except the last one, which is undrilled troops without a commander present. It's considered a complex move. You got to make this test. And it's a very simple test. Roll 2d6, like most rolls in this game, you need a 7 or greater if you're skilled, or drilled, I should say, pardon me, drilled or skirmishers. 8 if you're any other troops, undrilled, basically. Uh, there's a few handful of modifiers that might apply, and they're basically... Whether you're disrupted or disordered, fragmented or severely disordered, or if there's a commander present and his quality. Uh, so the better quality your commander, the more likely you're to pass that test. If you fail the test, you're still able to do stuff. You just basically are limited to nothing but a simple move. And you simply choose a simple move that your troop, your battle group could do. Uh, charging is here, by the way, which is always a straight line, maybe preceded by a wheel. Uh, that's considered a charge move. And as you can see, it's simple for everybody. Uh, charge distance, by the way, is the maximum move distance you normally can move for the terrain you're moving through. So there's no separate distance uh, recorded for uh, charging. It goes into wheeling. It goes into 90 degree turns at 180 degree turns. You'll notice that the sections of rules are not very big, but that's a good thing. It's not complex, folks. This is a very straightforward, simple game, and it's it's not complex, even in the movement rules. I know DBX gaming can get very complex, uh, considering its little fiddly movement uh, mechanisms. It talks about shifting. It's a little sideways shifting that could happen when you're moving forward. Expanding your frontage or uh, contracting 
your frontage uh, that's here. Variable move distances uh, could kick in if you're routing or if you are charging evading troops or if you're evading. Uh, they'll, they'll do so instead of doing their maximum normal distance. They're instead going to roll this dice. It's called the variable movement distance VMD roll. You make it and it tells you whether you add uh, up to two movement units to your normal movement or you deduct up to two movement units from your maximum movement. That's outlined in this chart. It's very reminiscent of uh, how it works in L'Art de la Guerre. Next, we have moving through friendly troops, interpenetration. Very straightforward. Bursting through friends, it can happen. Uh, movement of commanders, how it works. Basically, your commanders are quite maneuverable. They move seven movement units, which is the equivalent of light cavalry movement, uh, up to two times during the maneuver phase, and again, up to once during the joint action phase of the turns. They, they can be quite maneuverable on the battlefield, which is good. Uh, moving to an overlap, this system of rules uses overlaps. If you know what the idea, you should know what that is if you play a lot of DBX, but overlap pertains to. Uh, and it covers troops leaving the table. So that is the basics of movement. Now, there is a chapter in here, remember. Uh, covering the maneuver phase. And it's only a few pages uh, because most of the rules you've already read in the general movement rules. And see, this is the maneuver phase chapter. This is where you do most of your moving. And let's see, that's got quite a few pages. It's not that short. It's not that long either. This covers the more general stuff that applies during the movement phase. Uh, what counts as restricted area. You can pin enemy units if they're within two movement units of your front, for instance. You can move more than once as a group or individually if the commander's with them. Uh, moving into contact with enemy battle groups. Little chat, little section there. Feeding more bases into an existing melee. Oh, the fun. Conforming to enemy in close combat. Reforming when your unit is just, you just face in different directions. You might need to reform them. Uh, so that's the maneuver phase. I kind of skipped ahead there. Before that, of course, is your impact phase. Let's whip through this. This is mostly uh, where your troops charge. You declare your charges. Uh, some troops uh, are, might be forced to charge because they're shock troops. An example would be knights or Roman legionnaires or uh, Gaul infantry warriors. Uh, they might be forced to charge forward on their own. You take a CMT test to prevent that. Interesting enough. So it's not automatic. And a little advice when you're playing the game, the best way to prevent your troops from running out of a battle line or a defensive position uh, is keep your men, keep skirmishers ahead of your battle line. Uh, it prevents them from uh, being lured into a charge you don't want them to make. Uh, talks about troops that cannot charge. Attempts to charge or receive charge with skirmishers. Uh, there's all kinds of little details here. And again, they're simple and straightforward. Like each of these sections, just a very small little section of the rules. It talks about evading. Uh, where your light troops, most light troops, can evade a charge and escape being contacted against a charging enemy. Uh, and then we've got the maneuver phase, which we already covered. Next up, so there you go, folks. That's the end of part one to my look at Field of Glory 3rd Edition. Uh, review, somewhat of an in-depth look at what is it, what it's all about. This was part one. I do have part two coming up soon. We're going to finish off our look at the rules as well as the book itself. And I'm also going to give you my final verdict on it, whether or not it's worth having on your bookshelf and where it sets in my bookshelf as well. Let me know what you think in the comments. Do you like the rules? What do you think so far? Uh, you know, old hat at Ancients? Is this something that tempts you away from what you might currently be playing? Are you new to Ancients gaming? Let me know in the comments. I'm very curious. And also, like, share, subscribe, get this video out there. Stay tuned for part two, friends. And uh, remember, hang in there. It's only going to get better. Take care, my friends.